If you be seated, turn with me please to the book of Jude. If you get to Revelation, you've gone too far. Although depending on how your Bible's set up, it might be right across the page. <laughs> Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. We're not getting much further tonight. We're moving on to one verse further, verse 5 in our study. So here you are in verse 5, and he says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this. When you've been at this for a while, you've got to be very careful about watching your spirit when you go into preaching. Because it's very easy to kind of get the attitude, well, I already know that. <laughs> Come on, preacher, give us something new. We know that. Jude says it's my job to put you in remembrance. That means you know something already, but you need it reinforced. And by the way, just because you know a doctrine very well, it doesn't mean your brother across the pew knows it very well. And it doesn't mean that you don't need to hear it again. We need to be renewed in our minds, the Bible says in Romans 12. We need to constantly be at the Word of God and, and remembering things and being reminded of things. And by the way, there are times where I think, ah, people know this already. And then I kind of get shocked by the things certain people say about misunderstandings about doctrine or misunderstandings about, about application. I'm occasionally shocked by what people forget that I think they should, you know, they've been at this for a while. I think they should know this. Think maybe things they used to know, maybe things I've preached and taught, maybe thing, maybe if we're not careful, we just let things go by the wayside. We need to be brought into remembrance. We don't need to have the attitude of what is the next shiny new toy message. Like, give me that nugget that I've never heard before, preacher. Now, I get it. There are times where it's, you know, we seek the word of God that way sometimes. God, show me things I don't know. There's nothing wrong with asking God to show me things I don't know. But uh, there are times where we're, if we're not careful, we sort of almost demand something new all the time. And I tell you what, life doesn't work that way. You know, my diet doesn't work that way. You know what I love to eat? I love to eat comfort food. Yes, comfort food is stuff that you've always eaten and you love and you want to eat it again. I want me some pot roast and gravy with mashed potatoes and green beans and home fries. And you say, that's not all that special. It is to me. Amen. Uh, a straight up hamburger. Yes. Give me, some, give me stuff I know and that I know that I like. I do try something new occasionally, but we can't live on the shiny new toy. We need comfort food. We need to be reminded of things. And there's lots of verses in the Bible that talk about remembrance. Good night. You study through and all the time you'll see old patriarchs, old men of God, old prophets reminding the people of what they've come through, reminding the people of what God has done for them. Uh, we've got verses like 2 Peter 3, 1, where he writes, Beloved, I now write unto you the second epistle, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. He expected to stir them up with stuff they already knew. Because the bedrock things of the faith are wonderful. They bring joy. They bring peace. I mean, when I think of the things, I could talk about foundational doctrines like the salvation of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, 2 Peter 1 says this, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Even though you know these things and even though you're established in these things, 
It would be negligent for me to not remind you of these things. That's 2 Peter 1.12. So that's part of what we're doing, folks, in the church. The Lord's Supper, think about that. That's something we repeat over and over again. We do that on purpose because it says, and when Jesus had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We need to be a remembering people. Amen. We need to be reminded of so many things. First Timothy 4. Turn there with me, please. Come on. I don't hear pages. Where's First Timothy 4? It's like, Pastor, we use our phones now. These kids. <laughs> Get off my lawn, phones. Where's your pages with your Bible? All right, First Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heeds to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, uh, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with Thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Okay, so what is this preacher supposed to preach? There are going to be people that depart from the faith. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're going to be in the lying game. Their conscience will be seared. They're going to have these strange doctrines like forbidding to marry, like maybe, a, like maybe a New Testament priesthood of some kind that would forbid to marry. Yeah, the Bible says that that's something we should preach against. Uh, maybe there'll be a, a cult of believers that says you can't really eat that meat. What God's created everything that you can eat to be received with thanksgiving. Every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused if you receive it with prayer and thanksgiving and if i preach just those things and remind you of those things verse six the bible says i'm a good minister <laughs> amen we have so much in here about remembrance folks if we're getting into the word of god and you ever feel like well this is a little repetitive it's probably on purpose and it's probably because Part of what we do is a remembrance business. If I remind you of something you already know, it's not boring. It's me doing my job. Amen. So that's the first part of verse 5. I will put you in remembrance. Though you once knew this, let's move on to the second half. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now, don't forget the context of this, obviously, is contending for the faith, verse 3, verse 4, people sneaking in with false doctrines. Verse 5, what we're going to see is these people were, that were destroyed were actually people that should have known better but did not have faith. Jude reminds us of what happened in Numbers chapter 14. God delivered the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, they went out of Egypt and without intended delays came to a place called Kadesh Barnea. And Kadesh Barnea was right on the threshold of the promised land. But at that place, 12 spies were sent in to spy the land. And 10 of them said, oh, we can't do it. The people are too big. The cities are too big. It's impossible. And two of them said, no, we can, God's with us. We can do this. But the people would not listen. The people did not have faith. At that place, they would not go into the promised land of Canaan. And therefore, almost none of the people who had left Egypt with Moses, adult age, entered into the promised land. Almost none. That's quite a purging that took place. This verse here in verse 5 isn't about the destruction of the lost Egyptians. This is about the destruction of the unbelieving Israelites who would not go into the promised land. 
So we could dig into Exodus and Numbers and walk you through that via the Old Testament. But I found it interesting that it's referred to here in Jude. And there are at least a couple other passages in the New Testament as well that refer to that moment and help kind of interpret that moment for us a little better. So I thought we would turn to those. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians 10, starting in verse one. And by the way, don't forget the context of the Corinthian church. First Corinthians, we've got a problem church. We've got a church in dissension, a church in disagreement, a carnal church. And Paul is constantly dealing with them. And so he talked about in verse 27 of the prior chapter, keeping my body under subjection, temperance, a fruit of the spirit. Chapter 10, moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ, but with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And so the people of Israel experienced spiritual and supernatural events in their deliverance from Egypt, but still we find we're in unbelief. Amazing. Folks in the modern church are seeking some kind of God experience. And everything about the modern worship paradigm is all about how do we make people experience? What's the right level of lights? You'll notice in our church this evening, we've got bright lights on so we can see one another, so we can read our Bibles and read hymn books. Why are all these modern churches in the dark with lasers and smoke? They're trying to create something because they're searching for an experience. And if they don't feel that feels, they somehow feel like God didn't show up. Well, they didn't learn that from the Bible. They learned that from the modern Western false paradigm of worship. Now, these people were under the cloud, it says. That's the cloud of God's glory, if you study the Old Testament. God's glory during the day showed up as a, a cloud. It, it would obscure, if the enemy was behind them, the cloud was between the people and the enemy, and they could not see them and they could not pass through. If it was during the day and God wanted to lead them, the cloud would go before them, and they would experience that and see that. And then at night, that cloud turned into a pillar of fire. And they were all under this. They all saw it with their eyes. They all experienced the cloud of God. And yet many still did not have true faith. It reminds me of the rich man that went to hell. We have the story in Luke of Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man goes to hell. And he says, Father Abraham, please send Lazarus to my family. Because I don't want them to be here. And that's a good witnessing method, by the way. If your lost loved ones in hell, they don't want you there. Mm -mm. That rich man did not want his family to have to experience what he was experiencing. He said, please send Lazarus. And Father Abraham said, they have the prophets and the writings of Moses. Let them hear them. And I said, no, 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 no. If they, they won't believe. But, but just send someone from the dead and they'll believe. And he said, if they will not hear Moses and the prophets... They would not be impacted by a miracle with their own eyes, even someone that raised from the dead. Amazing. Folks, it's not about experiences. I, I like to experience the joy of God. I like to experience the peace of God. I like, the, I like the experience. When I see God do something, intervene in some way, I like it. I'm not saying we should never like, oh, I don't know. Oh, careful. God, I don't want too much joy, God. Something wrong with that. Right? Like, we don't want to fight that. <sighs> But America's looking for a drug, folks. And the modern worship paradigm is turning God into some kind of drug experience induced with lights and music, and it's a mistake. This experience did not save these Israelites. 
They, saw, they were under the cloud. It did not save them. It didn't matter what they saw. And it says they, they saw that. It, now, it, it caused the, the passing through the Red Sea a type of baptism, right? And that's a wonderful figure of what happened. If we want to look backwards and look at all the types and figures going along with Israel and Egypt, we know Egypt is a picture of the world and bondage. They were slaves. They were in bondage to the world. They were in bondage to sin. And then they passed through the Red Sea and they came out on the other side, a nation of priests, from slaves to priests, from slaves to the children of God, uh, a baptism in Christ. Amazing. It says they did eat the same spiritual meat. We know that God dropped manna from heaven for them. And even that wasn't good enough at one point. <laughs> Where's my burger? Quail until it, they were buried with quail. They did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now, they had manna, they had water from the rock. These are precursors or types uh, of the two Christian, uh, we can call them sacraments as long as we understand what we're saying with the word, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some people call the Lord's Supper communion. I understand that there's, you know, there are other churches that use the word communion, so sometimes we shy away from using it. As long as we understand what it means, I'm fine with it. Uh, communion is really just synonymous to the Lord's Supper, if, if that's how you want to use it. The word sacrament was used for an oath of allegiance. They got that from uh, the soldiers of the, of the Roman legions. They took oaths to their emperor, and it was considered a sacrament. And so the early Christians considered uh, the Lord's Supper, communion, and baptism to be oaths of allegiance to Jesus Christ. So if you ever hear them being called sacraments, that's what they're talking about, or that's what they should be talking about. <laughs> so we've got that going on here in verse 2 and 3. But then we have this interesting statement of the spiritual rock that followed them. Paul builds here on, the, there was this rabbinical tradition that said that Israel was supplied in the wilderness for 40 years with water by the same rock throughout their time in the wilderness. And so it says the rock, now it doesn't necessarily mean that the rock actually moved and followed them. It could be that the water from the rock continued to follow them. Uh, so that, that's a debate. I, you know, Paul here isn't being too in depth with this very short verse. The point's the same. Maybe the rock followed them. Maybe the stream of the water from the rock followed them. But the point is, is that Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, was present with Israel in the wilderness, providing for their needs miraculously. How are you in the desert all that time and wonder, oh, we just got water and man, isn't this nice? How do you take that for granted? Now, here's the thing. I say that tongue in cheek because then I, with self-examination, I realize I often take God's blessings for granted. I think we all do. Boy, do we need to be more thankful for what he does for us every single day. Amen. And the Bible says, it goes on to say that most of them were displeasing to God in their lack of faith. Most of them. And hey, broad is the gate that leads to destruction. So verse 6 through 10. I want you to notice this. We're still in 1 Corinthians 10. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's why Moses was up in the mount getting the Ten Commandments. They were having their big artistic dance festivals. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. So this is the condemnation of the ones that lived in unbelief. And it basically says, because of their unbelief, they committed these sins. Despite all that God did, and day by day, and despite experiencing God's presence with their eyes. Now, they never saw God, but they saw the cloud and they saw the pillar of fire. 
When the law was given, they heard the trump from heaven. They still got into idolatry and immorality. Here it is, folks. Our real, real faith, real faith is proven or disproven by our choices, not our words, by our choices. Not what we say we believe, but what we really believe. Thank you all, by the way, for pitching in for me Sunday morning. I had a really horrible cold. You can still, I still got a little hanger on. I'm, I'm almost done with it, though. So I just had the, the vice grip head thing going on. I did not want to share that. Uh, so while I was out, I heard a really great message. I watched online uh, from my friend out in Michigan, his church. And uh, there was an old, he had an old preacher preaching for him. And he said this, what it all boils down to is how much do you believe and love Jesus? How much do you believe and love him? Do you love him enough to say no to things? Do you love him enough to say yes to things? There are things that he wants his children to say no to. There are things he wants his children to say yes to. Are we, we will, do we love him enough? See, it's not about rules and the law. It's about love. It's about love. It's about love. And that's really how I challenge myself when I'm faced in the moment with some kind of mental sin or, or whatever I'm facing. I just, I try to take a moment in the spirit of prayer and say no because I want to love Jesus more. Say no to that thing because of my love for Jesus, not because of some rule, not because I, if, you know, if I do this, I might, you know, not make it. I, I'm already in. I'm already a child of God. Amen. How much do we love Jesus? It's about love. So we had tempting Christ. As some of them tempted, they were destroyed by serpents. We have complainers. We have Numbers 21 describes an incident where the people were complaining so much that he sent poisonous, fiery serpents among them. You might remember that. And then they took one serpent, they created a brazen serpent, they put it on a pole, and they said, look and live. And all people had to do was turn from what they were doing and purposely come and set their, come, to, come, to the, come to the brazen serpent. And by the way, if you have the, the medical symbol of today, the caduceus, I think they call it, that's the Latin. The caduceus is the serpent on the, on the pole. And that's a medical symbol, and that's based on that moment in the wilderness where they were healed by faith. Well, they were healed by looking at the pole. No, they were healed by faith. But they had to act on their faith. Yes. Complaining hearts of the people showed up. Turn with me to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, we'll, and then we'll be done. I'm already going longer than I want to on a Wednesday night. But you know what? This is too good. This is too good. Hebrews 3. We see Christ in the wilderness. But here again, we're talking about this verse of 5 in Jude, and it points to the time where the, the children of Israel lacked faith. And we see it in their works in 1 Corinthians 10. Then Hebrews 3, let's go down to verse 12. Hebrews 3, 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. That provocation, that's the term meant for the moment on the verge of the promised land in Kadesh Barnea, where the children of Israel had to make the choice to trust God and enter the promised land or to recoil in unbelief and fear. They, and it wasn't just unbelief and fear. They said there were hardened hearts involved. For some, when they had learned, did provoke. How be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses? For with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left 
us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Okay, this is a lot. Believers, partakers of Christ. I love that phrase, partakers of Christ. Those are believers. Those are those who turn from their sin and self and put their life's trust in Jesus. And we are gloriously called partakers of Christ, partakers of his obedience, partakers of his sufferings, partakers of his death, his resurrection, his victory, his plan, his power, his ministry of intercession, partakers of his work and his works, partakers of his glory and his destiny. When you say partakers of Christ, it says it all. Amen. And so he has the, ver the verse here about they hardened their hearts. Now, no, they had a lot going on in that moment. I mean, they had just fled everything they knew from Egypt. It was a day-by-day -day thing out there in the wilderness. You finally come up to the river. You think, this is going to be it. And then these people that you know and trust come back and say, there's no possible way. And so because of circumstances, they harden their hearts. No, that's incorrect. We often say that person, well, this and this happened to such a person. And because of the circumstances and because of what happened, their heart became hardened. Well, the fact is, we harden our hearts in response to what happens. It's not the wrong way. It's not the other way around. We are the ones that decide in our hearts how to handle our circumstances. We are the ones who just, and I'm not saying it's easy, but we are the ones that make the choice. I'm going to trust Christ in this circumstance or I'm going to get angry. I'm going to trust Christ in this circumstance or I'm going to be afraid. I'm going to trust Christ in this circumstance or fill in the blank. And any option, any alternative to trust in Christ is a problem. That's where we start to harden our own hearts. Folks, in sickness and in health, trust Christ. Keep that heart warm and open to him no matter what comes. Do not harden your hearts. It says they could not enter in because of their works. No, it says they could not enter in because of unbelief. Because of unbelief. You might be tempted to think the key to entering into rest is obedience, especially when we see Hebrews 3.18. But the disobedience mentioned in Hebrews 3.18 is an outgrowth of the unbelief mentioned in Hebrews 3.19. 3.19 is the capstone on the chapter. It's telling you all of these actions are because of unbelief. Unbelief was first followed by disobedience. It was unbelief that kept them out of Canaan. Sin didn't keep them out of Canaan. Lack of evidence did not keep them out of Canaan. Lack of encouragement did not keep them out of Canaan. Difficult circumstances did not keep them out of Canaan. Unbelief kept them out of Canaan. And folks, the only thing between us and the victorious life is our own unbelief. So the challenge this week, Wednesday... Do not languish in the wilderness in unbelief. Follow Christ.